I'd rather you shot a tin cans in the backyard, but I know you'll go after birds. Shoot all the blue jays you want if you can hit them. But remember, it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. Welcome back to Book Wave, the book club podcast. Today we're reading To Kill a Mockingbird. I'm your host, Scott. T- t- joined today by Pat. Hey, yeah. And Will. Hey. So I thought we'd begin today's podcast just by dissecting the title and giving giving up that little quote, little taste, and talking about what it really means to kill a mockingbird. And the author is Harper Lee, before I forget it. And also before I forget, visit our website at bookwave.club. All right, why don't you start us off, Pat? Well, essentially, a mockingbird sings. They sing lovely songs. That's why it's a sin to kill them. That's it. That's pretty much it. I mean, no <laughs> there it is. There's your analysis. There you go. Yeah. Tom um, Robinson is the mockingbird, Pat. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't you catch the metaphor? <laughs> Spoiler alert. The Tom Robinson. Childhood a innocence is the mockingbird, Pat. <laughs> Uh, I know, I'm pretty much, you know, I go for the short analysis sometimes, you know. But yeah, it's pretty much, um, that's essentially what the novel explores, is is mostly about childhood innocence, and it's a coming-of-age tale. And we follow Scout throughout the entire story, and the way that Harper writes it from her perspective is very fascinating, too, because... There are many uh, different bits of language that she, that Harper uses to describe what Scout sees, and especially when it comes to Atticus and how he has raised him and Jim. Um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty much a, yeah, that's pretty much what I got out of it, so. So I read this book. I was forced to read this book in high school, which sucks because I hated it just by principle. And it was a really profound book. And in reflection, I don't even remember the N word being used once in the book. Like that's how much it <laughs> like soaked in. And it's like almost every other page for certain sections that that happens. So yep. it was one of these things where it's like, I read the first page and I was like, wow, this is some of the most powerful like writing I've read in a while, why don't I remember any of this? Why didn't it sink in? And it's it's because of that sort of education forced reading thing that it really sucked. Because reading it now, and we did this with Catcher in the Rye, like I've come to appreciate the classics at, in my older age. But like I I remembered the 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 bigger pieces of the plot, right? Like Atticus was a good father, a good lawyer. He had like great morals and he defended a Negro, a black man in a town that was filled with racism. And he had a hard time doing that. And, you know, on a a broad stroke, it's a story about a lawyer who has a serious internal question to ask. And that is like, can he live with himself if he doesn't take this case? What kind of a man would he be if he doesn't defend this man? And this is a man who has been accused by white trash and it's white people against black people at a time when that's enough to hang a man. And, you know, in my research, I find that Atticus is sort of this role model for lawyers and that this is something that had a very profound impact on a lot of people that ended up pursuing law because he's just this amazing epithet for moral standing and and how to be a good man. But going through it this time, like I already knew that. So I wasn't really focused on the big picture. I was looking at the smaller characters and I had some pretty profound impact from Miss Caroline, the teacher in grade one. And was it Miss DuBose, the, the elderly lady, Lafayette, down the road who at the end of her life yeah. wanted to yeah. to get I off morphine. Right. 
and like those five pages or 10 pages on each of those characters where it's like here they are there they go they're, you're not talking about them again Th those had more of an impact this time through than the big story because i knew where the story was going but i forgot about all the stuff that that sort of hides in the cracks you know this 21 year old school teacher who's trying to organize a new system of education that is preparing a generation for factory work and you know the confrontation and the power struggle between her and scout when scout can already read and write at a third or fourth or fifth grade level and it's just profound that you know at, at 14 when i'm reading this book that didn't hook me right away and give me this insight you know this other side of the conversation that i was missing about power and respect between teacher and pupil and so that stuff really stuck with me this time around yeah you see like that fascination with the dewey decimal system when it comes to the teachers like oh the whole education system's gonna change <laughs> Yeah, and it's interesting because I found out that, like, I guess this Dewey guy actually did have a bit of a philosophy about teaching and hands-on experience, and all we got out of it was a way to organize books in a library. Yeah, and, like, you can see that in, like, a throwaway line when Jem's talking to Scout saying, yeah, it's going to be all about, you know, if you need to learn how to milk a cow, you go find a cow and milk it. If you need to learn how to build something, you go build it. But that's... That's not what it ended up being, just like you said, a way to organize a library. Well, and what's interesting to me is that in these first couple chapters where Scout goes to school, what I see is this sort of, like they, they put the education system on this pedestal so that you can get a clear look at it, and it's ugly, and it's stunting Scout's growth as a human, and it, like this yeah. is something where they're expecting you to be an idiot, and they're not planning for you to be intelligent and in fact if you are you're going to be punished because of it and like even when she tries to help her understand the situation of the townsfolk she's reprimanded and then you find out you know as a as an older person reading the book when miss caroline is crying in her desk like you know what she's been going through and you know that she knows yeah. that she didn't handle it right but you can't do anything in that situation but I have, a, I have a really good quote from the part where Scout's going to school. And she just says, As I inched sluggishly along the treadmill of the Macomb County school system, I could not help receiving the impression that I was being cheated out of something, out of what I knew not. Yet I did not believe that 12 years of unrelieved boredom was exactly what the state had in mind for me. And, like that, and this book is celebrated. Yeah. The, yeah. That still rings so true to me today. Like, that's exactly how I felt going through school. Why haven't we fixed it yet? How old is this book? 1960 and, it came out. And it's talking about a period in the 30s, almost autobiographically based on Harper's life. And I'm reading it in high school in the exact same context. They're telling me it was like for a hundred years. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, it's a great book. And it's like, here it is on page like 30 that this school system is broken and you guys are like, yeah, read this book. And it's like, but this book is telling me how bad your system is. How is it that this is the book that you've chosen to make me read? Yeah. yeah. It's like Socrates, to, to start to know anything, you have to accept that all you know is you know nothing. And then, you know, Calpurnia, she was a really big character for me as well. Oh, like the- I'm um, hero. The, the conversations they have just even the first time she takes them to church, right? Mm -hmm. And about how, like, Scout discovers she's living this double life where she's actually a very educated woman who works for a well-to-do white family. But when she's with her people, she has to speak their language because it would be insulting. And she knows that, that if she were to speak the way she could, that she wouldn't, she, she would separate herself. And you can't force anything on these people like if they want to learn to read they'll learn to read but telling them what they need to do isn't going to get them anywhere you can take a horse to water yeah yeah and and somehow that's the kind of struggle that we are i would say we're struggling with today which is where do we belong and in regards to what we have to learn or should learn actually the emphasis on what we should learn rather than just 
figure out our own environment and what we have to conjure up into what works for us. Yeah, and it's it's weird, right? Especially with all of the conversation going on right now in the States. Because, like, I know that we're not going to go too deep into this conversation because we're not authority figures on it. But, like, so when I'm reading about, you know, the black church, and then also on the other side of it, I have people trying to educate me about my white privilege on Instagram and how slave owners forced their slaves to adopt their Christianity and... and you know, the Sunday best was a competition between slave owners to make everybody look good. And then we have this book where it's just like they fully adopted the church and it's segregated. And now Calpurnia is dressing up for white kids. And it's just this weird sort of microcosm of society that I don't fully understand. But I would say, and I would also say that um, for Scout, at least, since she's learning about this new place that she's never been into before it's a good way for her to ask questions about you know why is this church different than any other white church or something like that why don't they have hymn books well because they can't read yeah because it, it wouldn't make sense to get books because they won't use them the money can go somewhere else and it's just like the perfect way to present it like even if it is kind of autobiographical it's the perfect way to present it through the lens of a child asking these questions because like you know it would be insulting coming from like like a 30 or 40 year old man who just didn't know any better like it, it helps kind of soften the blow a little bit i don't know it's like i think yeah you're right exactly. it's a lot it's a lot easier to explain these kind of things to a child who like oh you just you just don't know these things yet. You don't know how the world works, and this is just how it goes. And, like, only only the kid can really see a problem there. Like well, at, it's like, so, go ahead. Like, at the end of the book there, when Atticus says something like, it seems only the children weep when stuff like this goes horribly wrong. Yeah, and the other thing, too, is that, especially during... The, it was right after the court case when Tom is guilty. They he, Scout and Jim immediately become upset and say, why does this have to happen? It's not fair. Then Atticus has to explain it's the word of the jury. It's up to them. And it's that's how the legal system works. Even if you don't like it, you still have to serve as as a lawyer you still have to accept these facts like kind of like how um how socrates accepted his death and he was in the jail cell and circe kept asking him, why do you have to put up with this come on escape with me but he's like no i deserve this this is my fate well and it's interesting like when um like prior to the trial, you know, Atticus goes out and defends the door to the jail, right? And there's that mob right. that yeah. they they want to deal with the man. And Scout and Jem and Dill are spying on them. And Scout runs into the crowd and says, hey, Atticus, and turns around and realizes she doesn't know who these men are, but she's this innocent youth. And it's unavoidable. If you're a group of men and you see a young girl you cannot look at her as the enemy. <laughs> it's a young girl that doesn't know better. She, she hasn't had your world and your societal expectations impressed on her. She hasn't been formed into one of you. And there's something that happens when you're confronted with a young girl who turns to you and says, how's your entailment going, Mr. Cunningham? Thank yeah. you for the nuts. And it's like, oh, crap. Our rage and our feelings and our mob mentality cannot survive. Yeah, when it's then, pitted against the young girl. Yeah, then all the family ties start coming into play. It's like, oh, yeah, I had your, your little boy over for dinner one night. He was awful swell. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you, it doesn't, you cannot have those two things exist. You cannot have a personality and compassion and mob mentality and anger. It's like, 
you can't have family ties you can't be human and that's what happens is, is she rehumanizes this mob and the entire time she's standing there talking to them atticus knows they have the power to kill all three of them right now and he is just frozen fight flight freeze and yeah. he's just like there's only so much power I have over this situation. And right now this little girl has made a decision and I can't take that away from her. And you see that so many times the insight, this older father figure has, and it's, it's incredible. It is. And another part where he um, tells Scout and Jem about um Miss, Mrs. Dubros, I can't, mm -hmm. yeah, about her morphine yeah. addiction and saying that Atticus is wrong about defending Tom. And again, they get t Scout and Jem get upset by that, but Atticus has to tell them, you know, even if she sounds like this, we all know that she is nonetheless a human. She's, you know, Sick, old, Giant. stuck in her ways. Yeah. But that doesn't rob her of respect and human decency. And that's something that, like, the, ugh, the advice this man gives his children, like, why didn't it sink in? Don't let the insults and names that people think are insulting mean anything to you. Like, I feel like it's kind of part of the story, too, that when you're young, these lessons don't really sink in. Because you see a scout like, like, I wonder what it really means. And, like, fur further along in the story, she, like, kind of slowly catches on. But it's strongly implied that, it, like, it's it's really hard to understand these things until you've really seen the world, had life experience, and grown older and can actually understand it. And in yeah. a way, in a way, just, just to go back to that one quote at the beginning... Um, I would say that Atticus himself is a mockingbird because you never see him harm anyone. There's one time, and it's not a human, it, and it's only to defend the entire street, and it's that crazy dog, and it's like this whole shattering of child innocence again for Scout and Gem because it's like not only is Dad holding a gun, he's the best shot in the county. Yeah. yeah, he's the perfect example of what Jordan Peterson would label as meek. Like, he's a hell of a shot with a gun. They called him old one shot back in the day because of how good he was, but he never had a gun around the house. Knew how to, knew, had a sword, knew how to use it. He kept it sheathed. Yeah, and it's like, that's power. That's strength. Yeah. That's courage. That's wisdom. And we don't see a lot of that today. He knew that the pen and the word and the logos was mightier than the sword. And he practiced that belief. Right. That goes back to our conversation about self-practice. Yeah. Put his money where his mouth was. It's not and enough then... just to believe. You have to practice it. Which is links me to another part that I didn't want to let go. I forget his name. Oh, Mr. Dalfus. I don't know, he started a family with a black woman and had, like, all the kids. And, like, then he became the town drunk. So, like, everybody right. everybody in the town thought he was wasted all the time. He, cooked, he took around a Coca-Cola bottle with, uh, with a paper bag wrapped around it. So everyone thought he was carrying liquor in it and just carried it around like he was drunk. And by the time he explained it, I was kind of, like, more upset with him than I was at the start. Like, well, if his, his life just went to shit, that's fine. I can accept that. But this guy's actually reinforcing the stereotype that you would have to become a drunk in order to, you know, run off with a black woman just because you didn't like how people treated each other where you grew up. That, that yeah. part really bothered me. That one stuck with me. Yeah, it's very I haunting, too. Like you can tell, like he's got he's got his good intentions. He wants to do the best for everybody. He just wants to let all of the old people that he grew up with live in the same world that they're living in. Doesn't want to shatter any paradigms. But he also wants to live his own life. 
which I can respect, like the old libertarian lifestyle, but at the same time, like, if that's really what you believe, that white people and black people can coexist despite the color of our skin, then you're not really practicing that belief as well as you could be. Well, you have to, like, I can agree 100% with that notion that, you know, like, you have to make the world yeah, this, what you want it to this be. This is coming from a 21st century millennial, so, you know, it all comes into perspective when you're reading a book from the 60s or the 30s, even. <laughs> I just, I can't help but think of John Galt and that whole notion, and I know you haven't read Atlas Shrugged Pat, but... It, it's one thing to look at society and say, this is wrong, I'm going to change it. And it's another thing to look at society and say, this is wrong, I'll let it burn and I'll go do my own thing and completely remove yourself because you know that in attempting to change it, what you'll only end up doing is destroy yourself. And I think that there is, I, I don't even think that's a new thought. I'm, I'm certain that humans have been thinking it for centuries, you know, this notion that, oh, well, the old people are stuck in their ways, but in 20 years, they'll be gone. Right. Right. But... And it's awful, maybe. I don't know. Like, uh, the, the, echo <laughs> the echo still remains. The echo still remains. And I think if we're not really outspoken enough, I don't know. Well, and that's why we have different personalities, right? Like, there's going to be the people who are the philosophers that are hiding in the cave until, you know, the campaigners have rallied the f masses enough for them to be ready for the lesson. Because you can't, can't make a horse drink. No. You just can't. And, you know, you can do your best. You can create clubs of like-minded individuals and, and share your message as best you can. But when you're against something as big as the BS rules that society has brainwashed into thousands and millions of people, who can blame them? That's why it's always best to be different, not better. Another thing I wanted, another character comparison I wanted to make was um, Dill and Holden Caulfield. Hmm, that's interesting elaborate so i don't really know what dill's background story really is because the only things i know about dill is what he's told scout and gem right and mm. it's it's well, always another story they're gonna get married someday you know but Gee, it's like one minute <laughs> one minute his dad's got a big pointy black beard the next year his dad's building him a houseboat two weeks later he's hiding under scout's bed because he's run away from home and it's like this guy's ability to imagine and create fantasy worlds and just kind of like he's so disenfranchised with real life like he like at one point scout says he could read two books to my one but he'd rather remain in his own imagination and musings and come up with his own stories and it's like there's yeah, something that's... about that yeah, that scene where he uh, unexpected, he's under, I think he's under Jim's bed when um, they pull him out and then Atticus realizes it and he says, eh, don't, don't, don't worry. You're, you're not in trouble or anything. Let's, let's give you some food and I'll let your mom know that you're here and you can spend the night and that's it. And then when he, he sleeps on Scout's bed and then just listening to him going through like thinking about his own world and experiences that yeah i guess you can say that is similar to Cofield, but i don't see how how that's depressing in a way but i would i would say that it's kind of like again going back to this idea of learning about someone else's experience and not taking it judgmentally or whatever mm -hmm. well and it's like with holden um like he's his own kid right like and so is dill dill and holden are their own kids yeah, and they carve out their own path for themselves 
the safety nets exist for both of them, but they just don't want to take advantage of them. Like when he runs away from his parents, he says, you know, like they're, they'll show you, they love you. They'll hug you. Good night. They'll kiss you. But it's, I bought you this, go play with it. I bought you that book, go read it. And it's like, they'll do better without me. And he knows like he's a burden and he's just a bit too smart to realize that already because, oh, what, what trouble you get into when you realize, you know, you're a kid and you're a dependent. <laughs> And when you have no real struggle, you start to create your own. That's when he starts. Exactly. That's when we start getting into the whole Boo Radley story too. Starts cooking yeah. up all these adventure, adventure games. They start playing. You know, when you get get a bunch of kids like that together, imaginations run wild. Yeah, and it's interesting. I think we probably should talk about Arthur or Boo Radley at some point during this podcast because he's. The, the invisible hero he kind of he kind of starts off as like the main focus of the book and then gradually as all these other stories start to happen like the miss dubose thing like he just starts to get put on the back burner like they never talk about him during the school year because they don't walk by the place when it's not schools in session and they also think that boo radley is just this monster that exists or a ghost. in the house or a ghost <laughs> yeah or just dead just up the chimney yeah eats cats and squirrels until eventually scout sees him as again like a mockingbird who doesn't really do much doesn't harm anyone until <laughs> until the very end when yeah. they see him yeah and how yeah. how many like little throwaway like stories are based on that exact premise. Like I remember thinking about an episode of Fairly Odd Parents of all things, where it's like, oh, it's the exact same story. Like haunted house. They're they're afraid to throw the baseballs in the yard. Like is this where it all comes from? This book right here <laughs> started it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's that fascination with the the abnormal right like the the society outcast the unknown yeah the dragon in the cave uh back to jordan and that's Peterson. what it is <laughs> right like they're confronting the dragon you you know hands down that's a story about the confrontation of a dragon yeah exactly just like dills doesn't have any real struggle so like that dragon became boo radley yeah the the last few pages i don't know if we want to talk about the very ending but it it definitely got me tearing up a little bit oh it was, yeah it was pretty emotional by the end of it it's a really yeah. good story i don't think we need to spoil the end of it if you haven't read it by now please do yourself a favor and read to kill a mockingbird twice yeah then see the movie too i haven't seen the movie yeah. yet the movie yeah, we good. watched that in high school Huh. Yeah, and of course there's the sequel that unexpectedly came out. Not have read that yet. Oh yeah, like I know. Are you talking about? Yeah, because that was like an original draft of the book, but for some reason it was published like a year before she died. She was alive until 2016, and it's like yeah. if I had have appreciated this book ten years ago, like I would have discovered that the the author was still alive, and you know spoke to people and it was like missed that train i guess so yeah it was um it was a really good book i'm glad i got back into reading it again it's definitely something that we can all uh show to other people who have yet to read this and uh or like to go into more detail about the concept of innocence and uh racial inequality and uh about legal the legal system and everything i conscience. think it's a good fit yeah conscience i think we have to talk about um atticus's sister right because atticus had every reason in the world to be a racist person like he came from finch's landing which is this place that owned slaves and did well and then they started paying for freed men and women and did good but 
you look at his sister, Aunt Alexandra, and you can't help but see that sort of old thinking and that Southern woman sentimentality that you are a lady scout. You need to start acting like a, right. a lady. In fact, your name isn't even scout. You're Jean Louise and you need to be in a dress and you need to be seen and not heard. And there, there's a lot that you could pluck at in that whole sort of thing. Yeah. Whenever I was reading a bit about Alexandra, I felt like I was reading Atlas shrugged again, like, Oh, another one of these people <laughs> <laughs> basically just don't think for yourself huh <laughs> but yeah. like there there are a couple moments near the end where like you really see her humanity and it's like oh wow you know it it probably is a good thing that you were you were here for your niece or whatever your niece and your nephew like despite yeah, it's inescapable. Dis yeah despite all of your shortcomings like that the family sticks together, right? It's yeah. a nice wholesome that, message. The duty supersedes the opinions of Atticus's actions and his children. That she is there, it's a hard time, they need a woman, and she's going to do it. She's not going to begrudge them for it, but, you know, there's going to be confrontations and issues. But that doesn't mean you leave. Yeah, and she always goes on about, like, how little girls aren't supposed to wear overalls but there's a scene near the end where she's like oh you need some clothes here take your overalls that's what you need in a pinch right like oh that's a wholesome little moment like just one yeah. throwaway line and it's like oh that just makes you smile <laughs> it's really an art form this book yeah and like even the first paragraph the or the second paragraph and the first sentence that one really hit me where it was like after enough years had passed to enable us to reflect on the time we sometimes spoke about the events that transpired leading up to Jem's injury and it was like I read that sentence five times that's why I remember it because I was like what a sentence like this is a story about trauma this is going to be hard to tell and it was like just set the stage with one sentence. And it's just like, oh, yeah, you're an author. You're an author, all right. Yeah, like it really bookends it, too. Like when you go back to the first sentence after reading the last one, it's like, whew, that hits a bit harder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I really like this book. I like reading short little fiction books like this. I think this was a good primer for us to jump into uncle tom's cabin in the coming weeks right right but but they're like they're similar and completely separate like this is this is something of its own accord and they deal with you know, similar subjects but different aspects of that subject mm -hmm. and the time frame is a bit different too yes of course and it's just like there's a substantial amount of difference in what is being experienced by the characters but at the same time there's still too many similarities for it to sit right with you that in the middle of the great depression we're still dealing with those things of, of inequality and like just you know absurd that all of the systems of government could do nothing for the Ewells, for example you know the white trash family that by all accounts, according to Aunt Alexandra, they should be good people because they've squatted on the same land for many a generation. And that's what makes an upper class citizen is staying in the same place and, and building your kingdom. But for some reason, these people couldn't find two coins to rub together. And we're fine with that. Yeah. And in that same line of thinking, they talk about the Old Testament a lot, too, like yeah, they say the finches came out just the way they are right out of Egypt during Old Testament times. Like, well, that doesn't sound right to me, but okay. <laughs> you, like, you see these was... conversations happening from the point of view of these two children. I'm like, wow, Will, Pat, and I are having the same conversations on Bookway. <laughs> and it was interesting for me that they actually referenced specifically the Old Testament and not the Bible. Right. And I was like, oh, so it's still the Old Testament at this point. Like, 
It's not just, oh yeah, right out of the Holy Bible and you know you're referring to the story of the Old Testament. Like that, that was interesting. I'd like to see where the shift happens where it just becomes the Bible. And they even, I think they had a hymn about the banks of the River Jordan that they were singing in the black church. Yeah, right. And it's like, oh. We don't have a story to compare us to Matthew, John, or Paul, George, or Ringo? <laughs> yeah, well, the the black church, from my understanding, takes the, you know, the exodus a lot more seriously for, you know, obvious reasons. Slaves being, you know, freed and all, or freeing themselves, I should say. Yeah. Well, I'll say this. It surprises me that the education system would enforce the reading of a book that literally says the education system is useless in the first couple chapters. I mean, it doesn't revisit it, but like, if I was brainwashing a whole bunch of youth, this book would not have made the cut because it seems like it, it encourages you to think for yourself, which is why I recommend it. And I would say that the, you know, everybody's aware that the education system is, is terrible. And that they are making their own choices of how they want to learn, which is good. And that you don't need it to get a degree, although in some cases it's it's recommended, but you know, not necessary. But regrettably, we see that you know that choice is taken away very quickly when you lose opportunity and distribution of resources. You know, like. Right now, we're looking at the 3 million students in Ontario. How many of them are going to go back to school? How many of them are going to stay online? And I can tell you right now, there's a percentage of those students that do not have access to internet and do not have access to a computer and don't even have access to a good library. And like, it, it's one thing to you know take control of your education. It's another thing to know you can. And we're still at this point in a first world country dealing with the problems of being able to choose how to learn and that's ridiculous to me and you see the same kind of like metaphor in the book too where like some of the kids don't have the same resources as others like there's one family that doesn't even bring in the right kind of newspaper there's one kid that can't tell the difference between an advertisement and an article for their mm. homework assignment <laughs> so like it's it's still the same kind of inequality that exists nowadays that did back then just in different forms yeah and it's crazy to see that that standard of teaching has perpetuated itself so well and like i don't know if i actually have a memory of cue cards in grade one where it's like cat Buh. Boy. Any thoughts, children? Like, yeah, why are we here? What's the meaning of life? <laughs> <laughs> How do I tie my shoes, teacher? <laughs> How does this apply to my existence on this plane of reality and get me the white picket fence? And why would I want to work for 40 years, Mrs. Morgan? <laughs> why, do we have to why do we have to retire at 65? Well, that's How is just... it that we can even live for 65? Well, that's just the way it is, William. That's just okay. the way it is. <laughs> is it half time yet? No, not for another half an hour. <laughs> 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 There's one other point that I wanted to talk about where uh, when the kids learn for the first time that Atticus had a choice whether or not he could defend Tom Robinson or not like he was appointed as a defense lawyer but he could have he could have turned it down like uh, Scout and Jem overhear a bunch of people and Scout just thinks oh well, that would have been a pretty good excuse to use at the schoolyard why didn't why didn't why didn't they just tell me that they forced him but uh then they found out that you know he wasn't forced and that Atticus never once used it as an excuse. Like, no, I, I choose to do this. He never once said they gave me a choice and I took his just, yep, I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do, kids. It's just like a fun little 
fun little bit that I picked up on where when you even yeah what he says like if I didn't defend this man I, I would have no right telling you what to do I'd have no right living here I'd have no right going to church or talking to God and you know you hope to heck that you don't get one of these cases in your life as a lawyer, but every lawyer knows that there's going to be one of those cases where you have to do it. You don't have to do it, but you have to do it. Yeah. Like, uh, and there, there's also the, um, it's kind of similar to, uh, the scene with Boo Radley and, scout and jim realizing that he's not a monster or anything he's just an innocent man and um they were just misunderstood the entire time and scout says when they finally saw him why he hadn't done those things attic and she looks at atticus and says he's a really nice man and atticus says most people are you now finally see them for who they are yeah elon musk most people are good. <laughs> what are you saying about Elon Musk? That's, that's his quote. Most most people are good. From the Joe Rogan oh. podcast. Akira made a wave about it. <laughs> He's also an alien. One. I was like, wait. Is, is he bad? Is he the exception? Or did he say this? <laughs> Elon Musk. A? Most people are good. <laughs> Elon Musk. <laughs> also Elon Musk. I'm an alien. Yep. Alien Musk. Elon Musk. But yeah, then uh, I think it's Miss Maudie has a quote a little bit later that says, it's, it's not often that we from Maycomb are called on to be Christians, but, you know, when it does happen, Atticus is always the one to answer that call. And then there, then there's another line in there about, like, it's going to be a while before you realize how much of an outstanding person your father really is. It's like... Yeah, like compared to all of these other people, it's easy for us to be like living in 2020. Like, yeah, Atticus is truly a hero, but back in the day when this was written or when these events occurred, it was a whole other story. It was yeah. brutal. So, yeah, like we alluded to earlier, we're going to be covering Uncle Tom's Cabin, going a little bit further into the Bible. And I'm sure we'll get into something else pretty crazy. And until then, check us out at bookwave.club, Anchor, YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And we'll see you next time. May the force be with you. Or equal to mass times acceleration. Later. <laughs>